Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, section. I'm Lewis Hassel and our topic today is leading or lagging. Is digital pathology a bane or a boon to pathology training programs? Uh, first off, I'd like to just state that I have uh, nothing to disclose. I have no financial interests uh, pertinent to the topics here. I am, however, especially an editor for Path Presenter, which we will cover during this talk. So what is the promised land of digital pathology? At least in terms of education, I think there is a promised land. It's the ability to consistently and reliably produce competent, trained pathologists adequate to the needs um, of our practice of medicine and healthcare, both in this country uh, domestically and throughout the world. Now I've chosen this image to illustrate uh, something that I think is important. Uh, cultivation of rice requires a period of time when the uh, patty is immersed in water. Um, and so uh, the construction of uh, the, the, the cultivation of rice on a, on a hilly uh, landscape is very difficult and requires a tremendous amount of engineering and uh, effort to go into to construct these patties and engineer the hydrology so that year after year, uh, these can then be used to grow and harvest uh, one, two, and sometimes even three uh, crops of rice. Now, once you have put in that initial effort and have built the patty and have constructed the uh, proper water flow and so forth, uh, it will produce year after year with just the uh, nominal sorts of routine inputs. Well, that's kind of what I'd like to see us do with pathology. But what's been going on uh, traditionally in pathology is that we've been, uh, we haven't really been building that uh, sort of patty. Uh, we've been relying on a very uh, uh, longstanding and uh, conventional pattern of uh, apprenticeship type of teaching. A lot of head-to-head -head, head -head microscope work on site in a specific location. Uh, we've re relied on rotations between services or modalities, cytology, surge path, chemistry, et cetera. And we have depended heavily on the randomization of whatever comes through the door to supply learning content for trainees. Uh, digital pathology uh, potentially allows us to shift that a little bit. If we think about the ACGME competencies, patient care, medical knowledge, professionalism, practice-based learning, communication skills, and system-based practices, as they apply to pathology, what, which of these could uh, digital pathology uh, impact in terms of acquiring the competency and then assessing the competency? Well, uh, this is something we've thought about for a long time. And in fact, in 2010, uh, we presented this uh, concept that in fact, um, digital tools available to residency programs could allow us to alter the paradigm and use them to assess not just medical knowledge or uh, patient-based care, but in fact, almost every one of those competencies in some form or another. Well, what is needed today? Um, I think uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has demonstrated that we need a mobile access from anywhere kind of education. Uh, we also need standardized and curated content. Uh, there is so much content now uh, that uh, in order to make it effective and helpful for our trainees, uh, it needs to be uh, curated with greater care. Uh, that's difficult to do in a, uh, a Google search age uh, where all of the internet is uh, pretty much uncurated, uh, but it is not impossible. We also need uh, there to be customizable and learner organized and directed content. Uh, again, something that the internet age can allow. And then we need to have uh, some sort of mechanism of demonstrating effectiveness in achieving competencies using these kinds of tools uh, from wherever. And ultimately then also, working hand in hand with the credentialing agencies and the certifying agencies to allow that to lead to competent and credentialable practice. So essentially I'm talking about a residency in the cloud, um, but um, that may not be such a great pipe dream. It may be quite possible. So first of all, uh, in terms of uh, ease of access, we know that um, uh, we can, dial up just about anything on our mobile devices or our laptop 
there are so many uh, resources available, textbooks, atlases, um, and uh, programs, games, digital slides, et cetera, uh, that uh, these tools have become uh, the uh, pocket uh, companions of virtually every medical trainee uh, in the world today. But there are times when no service uh, certainly presents a problem. Uh, it's possible also with these to develop certain niche uh, categories of uh, training that uh, many programs cannot uh, of themselves supply uh, in the same quality or same uh, ease of uh, adaptability. Um, these collaborative efforts between uh, ASCP and uh, APF to develop lab management uni university with ASCP and the API to develop uh, the University of Pathology Informatics, and then more recently, the training residents in genomics effort uh, are just uh, three examples of wonderful collaborations that fill a niche need of education and that are very well suited to uh, on-demand online uh, access. So then, this, then the question becomes, how do we standardize content? Uh, once you begin to do that and annotate and enrich the value of that, then comes the question of verifying effectiveness. There are lots of digital slide archives. There are lots of places people can go to look at pathology materials, images, and so forth. Uh, but it's not just that that I think we're talking about. I think we want a rich learning environment where full case scenarios with texts, maybe audio and video, interactive lab results, radiology, and potentially even virtual reality experiences uh, are there to allow uh, a greater level of interaction with the material. Uh, well, if this sounds a little bit like a video game version, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's where we're heading uh, and maybe creative minds can uh, begin to develop those kinds of uh, uh, processes. Uh, this was an early effort on our part to develop uh, something that was uh, keyed to both student or resident level learning uh, by offering uh, digital slides online for medical students and residents wherever they are training. Um, and these came uh, many times with uh, annotations, with radiographs, with clinical histories, um, and the opportunity to explore the digital slides. Um, several other places obviously have been doing these kinds of things for quite some time. And so the Digital Pathology uh, Association very wisely chose to uh, uh, collect and uh, collaborate all of these things under Eric Glassie's leadership uh, into a whole slide imaging repository uh, that would allow people to go and say, oh, who's got uh, an archive on this or, or that, um, and uh, direct their search uh, from such a site. Uh, this has led in turn to uh, an even, uh, even more rich expansion uh, where, as here, for example, um, Pathology Basics for Residents uh, by a, a group in Germany, um, and other kinds of tools like this have been directed. Uh, very often, however, these are a little bit, um, a little bit slim, I guess I would say, in terms of digital slides, and they, uh, there is some interoperability uh, challenges that are built in uh, that uh, make <coughs> accessing them readily from anywhere uh, by a wide audience uh, a little bit challenging. Well, uh, bring that up to 2020, <coughs> and there is uh, uh, a new uh, tool on the block, if you will, that uh, has been made available again uh, uh, through the Digital Pathology Association, uh, the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, um, which is a, a branch of PATH Presenter. Uh, this is a great tool that is really media indifferent, uh, allows digital slides, radiographs, images, video, et cetera, et cetera, to be uh, included uh, in uh, the presentation or in the uh, uh, materials that are there. It also has assessment and feedback tools um, and can be either personalized uh, or, or institutionalized, uh, as well as offering a, a public library of pathologist curated slides. Uh, these are tools that uh, uh, allow individual sharing and allow presentation uh, and even allow uh, video recording. So just to give you an example, uh, here one of the early efforts uh, of presentation forming that I was involved in with was this uh, lower GI po polyps, the basics, intended to orient residents to what was going on in the GI tract and how they could differentiate the different types of polyps. So this was a systematic effort to provide 
didactic information together with histologic images uh, and a host of uh, histologic example slides uh, that showed uh, the uh, entity under consideration. So here, for example, uh, within the presentation, a learner could view this, uh, review the digital slide and go, ah, there's the issue. Additionally, annotations were available. Uh, so for example, just uh, right here, uh, there's the annotation, the details that go along with it to help ensure, ensure and reinforce uh, the learning uh, that is intended from this kind of presentation. So in this manner, content could be presented in a systematic, organized fashion, allow comparison and contrasting um, and individual pacing to uh, accomplish the educational goals. Uh, our assessments on this process to date have shown extraordinarily good results. Uh, our residents after one or two months on surgical rotations using this tool and the uh, material that comes in through the door have uh, exceeded the, func the uh, performance of residents uh, at their end of their first year uh, of uh, performance after four or five months uh, on uh, our services. In addition, um, the content and path presenter includes uh, a variety of uh, what they're termed high yield sections, uh, which take organ systems and provide uh, uh, the best of the best in terms of digital slide examples of uh, content. So uh, that's our hopes for, for Path Presenter. Um, additionally, uh, there are things that we've learned about how people transition from being a trainee to being an advanced uh, and, and capable pathologist. And it has to do with uh, their identification in a more rapid and uh, um, facile manner of the regions of interest, the areas where the, the real information and the keys to diagnosis are. Um, and digital tools allow uh, us to, to think about how we may be able to promote this process uh, more readily. Um, our goal in this is to enable learners to go farther and faster than ever before. And this is because basically there's a lot more to know. If I look at how much uh, was uh, there to be studied and learned when I was a trainee uh, 40 years ago, uh, it doesn't compare uh, with even half of what uh, we ask of our trainees today. So if we build this PADI, if we build these digital tools, will it enable us to get um, uh, this process going, or will the ground shift again? Uh, and it will require more than a minor me refresh. Well, I think, I think if we build it, uh, we will see the results. Um, currently, a large number of residents go on to one and sometimes two uh, fellowships. This is not, I think, due to a failure to launch because they're not qualified for jobs, but because there is so much uh, need for advanced uh, understanding and depth of understanding in particular areas. Now let's talk just briefly about uh, social media. Um, uh, these have been tools that have been available for a considerable length of time um, and, and have been discovered, uh, I would say, uh, dramatically over the past decade uh, by uh, the pathology community, uh, perhaps uh, spearheaded by our colleague uh, Jared Gardner and many others uh, who have uh, promoted their use and uh, flooded uh, these platforms with uh, highly useful tools. Um, I think uh, there's a tremendous value uh, in case sharing via social media. Uh, these can also be used as a means of obtaining consultation uh, or QA uh, help. Uh, they can be used for patient education. Um, they can be used to present lectures, provide streaming, video links, um, even streaming meetings at times, uh, such as this. Um, and certainly uh, live tweeting educational events and meetings is a, a favorite pastime of many of the social media mavens uh, in the pathology community. Uh, here's one example of uh, my efforts in this regard. Uh, using YouTube as a means of providing digital case examples and lecture examples, and then promoting that to a group such as Fatrian Zaifaub in Vietnam, this uh, group dedicated to helping uh, developing world pathologists improve their uh, diagnostic capacity and understanding. Um, and as you can see, uh, just after a couple of days of uh, being posted, it had reached uh, uh, over 2,000 uh, eyeballs. Uh, so these kinds of tools can have a dramatic reach. Uh, they're very low cost 
and uh, many times can be done quite uh, readily and uh, uh, simply with very minimal uh, technological experience, my own, for example. Well, the next step, I think, beyond this is then to verify effectiveness. And this is perhaps harder because there's not as much data in this particular area as I think we need. So uh, one of the questions I have asked is, what is the number of instances and variations that a resident needs to experience or examine in order to develop a competency in a particular diagnosis or in a particular differential diagnosis? So here's my, uh, just pulled out of the top of my head examples. Uh, to differentiate a tubular adenoma from a sessile serrated adenoma, um, how many examples do they have to see? Either direct instances and where it's a consideration in the differential. Is it 25? Is it 50? Uh, maybe it's only 10. Uh, in my training examples, uh, we used fewer than 10, uh, and the performance was quite uh, expert. Uh, if we look at a phylloides uh, tumor versus a fibroadenoma, uh, well, maybe it's a small number, but maybe it's a bigger number. Um, we don't know this data, um, and yet there's a whole host of uh, differentials where this is really a critical skill. Um, and so I think we need to be, be developing some testing and some me mechanisms. Now, if you look at expert panels, uh, very often uh, they will uh, you know, develop a high degree of con concordance using you know, written criteria and so forth, uh, and can develop 70, 80, 90% concordance on a given diagnosis after just using written criteria and their own experience. Trainees, I don't think it will be that easy. I think we'll need some real data to verify that this is uh, going to be uh, competency. Now, sometimes I think uh, competency is uh, confused with um, um, impairment. Um, and uh, this particular SAD case, uh, which we uh, unfortunately were fairly close to um, in terms of having to try to pick up the damage, uh, I would say was not so much based on uh, impairment due to drugs or other substances, but was really a case of uh, unfamiliarity, of not having seen enough of the entities, of not having considered some of the things and the possibilities that were there. So um, as we think about how to prepare and prepare competency, um, uh, a lot of that is really just providing a sufficient diversity of cases in sufficient quantity of cases that uh, trainees will not be impaired in their diagnosis from an intellectual standpoint, uh, irregardless of whether chemicals are involved. Uh, an ex another example of something that we're doing to, tell to try to promote this is uh, the frozen section competency development project. So we did some studies very early on using uh, iPads to see if uh, pathologists could uh, use uh, whole site images to make uh, an appropriate uh, diagnosis uh, of a frozen section. And the answer that we came to very conclusively was yes, so those uh, quality of images is, is quite sufficient to make an adequate frozen se section diagnosis. Can we then use such tools to enhance the skills of residents uh, to interpret frozen sections, particularly the challenging cases? Uh, we find that our residents don't get enough uh, experience with frozen section just from their uh, 12 months or so on the surgical pathology service. Um, they may see 100 or whatever, or even if they were to send a, spend a month in a, in a frozen section laboratory, they might not see three or 400 cases. Um, but digitally, we're not limited by what comes through the door. And so we believe and have begun to develop just such a tool to help uh, residents uh, develop and have experience eval evaluating challenging uh, frozen section cases, those with discrepancies, those with uh, folds, those with bad staining, those with all sorts of uh, weird clinical histories uh, to help them to become familiar and thus better prepared for a competent and safe practice. Uh, here's an example of the early uh, process here, our first uh, efforts on frozen sections, and these are the cases that were used um, in the uh, initial iPad study, uh, which was uh, carried out uh, with the help of one of our medical students as well. Um, but we've expanded on this considerably and now have uh, quite a library of frozen section cases, which are freely available to the public if they uh, uh, just need to let me know and I can send the link and so forth. So if you're interested in participating, 
There's my contact information. If you've got trainees that would like to uh, participate in that process, uh, we put out about 20, 25 cases per quarter uh, and plan to continue to do so for a period of time. Uh, just get in touch. So there are some other things I think that are open for investigation in this process. Um, and um, one of those is what's the optimal number of instances? We've just mentioned that. Uh, what does, uh, what sort, does, it, does it matter if we present these systematically or otherwise? Is retention going to be better? How can the eye be trained to focus on these regions of interest more effectively? Uh, do we need to have some sort of game-like interactions with peripheral uh, uh, items to uh, train uh, macular attention to those abnormalities? And do our evaluation and assessment mechanisms currently predict later diagnostic performances or are there better simulations that would do? Well, there are a lot of new ways of looking at things, new enriched uh, textbooks uh, that PATH presenters uh, come up with. There are also diagnostic simulators that our surgical colleagues use. There's no reason why these kinds of tools can't be made available uh, for uh, training pathologists in gross dissection and other uh, media. Uh, we've established that uh, uh, digital slides in conjunction with journal articles are themselves uh, enough to enhance performance of uh, students who view them uh, and look at them and uh, we would hope that more journals will use them. Uh, this is an example of the PATH presenter type textbook, a, a skin uh, textbook that allows nice side-by-side -side comparisons uh, with the histologic differential, clinical, and other sorts of features so that you can look at the digital slides and compare what's there, what's not uh, in competing uh, diagnostic entities that may uh, come up uh, for consideration. Powerful tools are becoming available. So why do we worry about this? Well, uh, I think the important thing to be aware of is that there is a crisis coming, both domestically and internationally. First of all, beginning in 2013, uh, Raboy and colleagues from the CAP were warning that we were facing a shortfall in pathologists. Um, well, so that was a projection based on retirement rates, ages, demographics, and so forth. Does that come to pass? Well, uh, guess what? Yes, we're in the middle of it. Since 2007, over that decade, about a 17, 18% decline of pathologists, which continues to accelerate. Um, and thus we're looking at a potentially smaller workforce that could be disastrous for the healthcare system in the United States. If we look internationally, the situation is even more dire. Uh, the projected increase in non-communicable disease burden uh, in the developing world, which will bear the brunt of the uh, cancer burden uh, in the next uh, two decades, uh, will be totally swamped by the, uh, that burden. Uh, and we have not begun to address how we're going to train and equip the developing world to thwart that. And needless to say, as we've witnessed with uh, many and many diseases, uh, what happens in the developing world pays uh, dividends in one way or another uh, in the developed world. So how could we do this? Well, um, we're not going to be able to increase the number of training slots very quickly. It's been unchanged for a long time. But if we improve the, the methods of training, uh, and achieve competency at an earlier stage more quickly then either via staggered starts or shorter training cycles, an increased number of competent and trained pathologists could be produced each year. Now this of course relies on the fact that our crediting boards are looking at competency and if they will uh, begin to lax up a little bit on the time-based certification criteria and move bravely towards competency-based uh, uh, assessments, uh, we may have hope here. But if, if we're locked into time and a limited number of slots, uh, trouble looms ahead. So in our race to the future, are we leading or lagging? Well, I think in many ways we are leading. There are many great things happening, but are we lagging where we need to be? I think we are. I think we're well behind the eight ball in terms of what's ahead and we need to be paying attention to that. With that, I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you for joining me.